Hi folks, being able to use a compass is a really useful skill and can get you out of the odd tight spot. The good news is picking up the basics of it is dead easy and even better you can learn how to do it in your local piece of open land uh, with any map you happen to have. So today that's what we're going to do, I'm off to my local park and I'll show you how simple it is. Welcome to the Camping Astronomer. My name is John and I make videos on camping, astronomy and walking. If you like what you see in this video then please check my channel out as there may be others that interest you there. But in the meantime let's crack on with today's video. Okay so before we head out then it's going to be worthwhile spending a few minutes actually looking at a compass and the different features of that compass. And then I'm going to outline a uh, kind of real life scenario from seven or eight years ago, seven I think, uh, where it was quite important that I was able to use a compass and we'll be able to replicate that exact scenario out in the local park, even though that scenario was in the Lake District and my local park is in Sussex. So let's have a little look at a, a walking compass now and uh, go through some of its features. This type of compass is called a protracting compass or a base plate compass and it's a standard one that's um, used by walkers and we'll look at its individual features. This here is its base plate. There are sometimes but not always a magnifying glass here. I find it really useful um, but if you've got younger eyes than me that's probably not so much of an issue. Around the side are some scales that help you measure off distance. They're officially known as Roma scales. There's an arrow here that's called the direction of travel arrow and that's a really important thing. This here is the compass housing and that rotates. And it's marked up in degrees which is enables you to take your bearing. The compass needle sits inside the housing and the red end is magnetised to always point north. The housing itself is filled with a, a fluid that helps damp the motion of the, of the needle. Inside the housing are a series of lines that you can see here. And these are called the orienting lines and they help you set the compass up on the map. We'll see all of this when we do the practical exercise. And the central area here is marked up with a red arrow and that's called the housing arrow. So those are the primary features of a, a standard walking compass. And we'll see the, the actual in use of these when we do our practical scenario out in the local park. I'm now going to take you back to the scenario that we're going to recreate. It was early spring about seven years ago and it had been an unusually cold spring and I was up in the Lake District with my mate and Miss Camping Astronomer who at the time was uh, I think 10 years old. We used to go every year to do a bit of hill walking when we got there we could see that there was still quite a lot of snow on the fells, particularly the higher ones. So given that we were with 10 year old Miss Camping Astronomer, I decided we were going to avoid any of the higher fells and instead stick to hills that were 500 metres and below. So I picked a hill called Galbarrow Fell on the edge of Ullswater which had some nice views from the top allegedly and was 480 or 490 meters so it fell within the uh, constraints that I'd set. So off we trotted, I plotted a little route around Galbarrow Fell and we had rather a nice walk and got to the summit. We stopped for a cup of hot chocolate and a snack at the summit and there was very nice views across to Owls Water. It was uh, extremely cold, about 0 degrees and you, there was still snow on the ground. But as we sat there, 
drinking our hot chocolate and eating our snack, gradually the clouds came in and got worse and worse over time until we reached a point where after 15 minutes, it was actually difficult to see much more than about 10 metres in front of you. Galbarrow Fell's a fairly unfrequented fell with not many paths across it. So now we were faced with the prospect of navigating our way off the summit in very poor visibility. And it was here that the ability to use a compass became extremely useful. We parked our car here and gone to see Aera Force, which is a really nice waterfall, incidentally, if anybody's ever um, in the Ullswater area. And then walked along this path here, up to a wall, followed the wall across, basically, to the summit here. And this is where we had our um, hot chocolate and sat down. At this point, the weather closed in and we wanted to finish our walk and, and get off the hill safely. One option would have been to have, have retraced our steps backwards, but there was a, um, a way of making the walk a, a circle, which is a bit more satisfying. And in order to do that, we needed to get down to this path here. Now, to get down to that path, if you just end up walking down here, you end up on extremely steep ground around here, which isn't something that um, I wanted to do with a, a 10 year old. So the plan was to go from the summit here where we were sitting to navigate off the summit to this path here and the ground was, whilst it was descending, it was relatively shallow. And then if we could hit this path, essentially this fo followed contour lines. So it was gently descending and then we could trot our way back to the car park. So what we needed to do, there's no path between here and here. And what we needed to do was to take a bearing and follow that bearing in order to intersect this path. And it's that process that we can look at in my local park tomorrow, how we actually did that and got to a, a nice path that would take us safely home. So while I'm uh, having a stroll to the area that we're gonna do our practical exercise in today, uh, we might as well discuss the elephant in the room, which is why not use electronic navigation aids for example, a Garmin GPS device or your phone even. And the answer to that really is that you don't want to be reliant on an electronic device or any device for your safety when you're out and about. So you really want to be using your own knowledge. Batteries of these devices can run out at the drop of a hat using GPS uses batteries much faster than having something on standby and you want your phone in particular to have the maximum amount of charge it can have so that if you need it to call the emergency services you've got plenty of uh, battery strength available to you. I actually use my phone for filming also so I'm particularly keen to keep my battery life up. So you should always have a map and compass with you and have at least a basic idea of how to use uh, it. If you are unlucky enough to have to call out Mountain Rescue, they should be distinctly unimpressed if it turns out you're lost and you've got no map and compass on you. That's not to say that electronic devices don't have their place. I have a I think it's a SatMap Active device that I occasionally use and I've got a walking app on my phone, I think it's called Osmond, uh, which is really good incidentally. But what I use it for is every now and again I'll stop and confirm my position 
so I know precisely where I am. Yeah, I don't use it for navigation for reasons of preserving my battery life, but it is quite handy every now and again just to stop and check that you are where you think you are. Right, well, I've got to as good a spot as any. Um, reasonably open area, bits of woodland around me. Um, but I can go a fair distance in, in any direction. So this is going to do, and this is where we put our imagination hats on. So now you've got to pretend that instead of looking at some nice sort of parkland, that I'm on the side of Galbarrow Fell, just at the top by the Summit Cairn. And I want to get my way down towards a footpath. So we're going to take a bearing from where we are right now to that footpath. So here's the map we're using then, um, the northeastern area of English Lakes, despite the fact that we're sitting very firmly in Sussex. So we're sitting here, and where we want to get to is here. And so the first thing that we do is put the compass with the, lo the long side of the compass along the direction that we want to travel. So that's from the top of Gow Barrow, basically to the little shooting lodge. And you want the direction of travel arrow here to be pointing in the direction that you want to travel. Now what we do is rotate the bezel of the compass housing so that the housing arrow points north and these orientation lines here are parallel with the grid lines which is like that blue line there and this blue line here. You can then read off the compass, the bearing that you want to to travel on and here you can see that it's a hundred degrees it's marked up in 20 degree increments with a bigger line for, for the 10 degrees and then there are little two degree increments in there so fundamentally that's the bearing that you need to follow so now comes the only slightly complicated bit of taking a bearing and that is to account for something called magnetic variation. Now anybody watching this in the UK at the moment, probably for the next least five years, can uh, happily ignore this, but everybody else uh, needs to pay a bit of attention to it. And the issue comes about because there are actually uh, three Norths associated with the globe. There's True North, which is basically the North Pole where all the lines of longitude intersect and that's irrelevant as far as we're concerned. There's Magnetic North which is where your compass needle points to and there's Grid North which is north on the map and the trouble is that Magnetic North doesn't actually coincide with Grid North and it varies year on year as the magnetic pole essentially uh, move slightly across the globe. Now at the moment in the UK as of um, 2021 the difference between magnetic north and grid north is probably around a degree or so we'll have a look in a minute which in most instances but not all uh, you can ignore. But if you were, say, in the US, for example, then that difference in certain parts might be as much as 20 degrees. And what it means in practice is that the bearing that we've just taken could well be 20 degrees out from where you really need to go. And that's going to put you miles off target. So we'll have a little look at um, magnetic variation now and see how you can account for it. The information that we need to work out magnetic variation is given to us in the legend of the map and it's 
covered by this little area here and there's a diagrammatic here and some text and the text tells me that the map was produced in 2010 and at that time the magnetic variation was about 2 degrees 37 minutes west of grid north. Furthermore it tells us that the annual change per year is about 10 minutes per year so we can use that information to work out what the 2021 magnetic variation is. So there are 60 minutes in a degree and we had a 10 minute movement to the east per year in magnetic variation. So 2010 to 2021, say 11 years, and 10 minutes times 11 is 110 minutes, which if you then divide that by 60 to get it to degrees, is just under a two degree variation or movement to the east over what the legend of the map told us. So what's happened since 2010 then is this magnetic north arrow here which was 2 degrees 37 minutes west of grid north has moved east by just under two minutes in between 2010 and 2021. So it started off 2 minutes 37 now it's moved this way by two minutes. So the difference between grid north and magnetic north at the moment in the UK is about half a degree. And it will depend in the UK where you are as to whether uh, in some places, like I think the uh, Cornwall area, for example, the two might actually be spot on by now. But for most of us, I suspect it's still very slightly west of grid north. Now the thing is, when we're looking at our compass, we've got increments of um, two degrees marked on there. And well, my eyesight's not good enough to account for a half a degree variation, um, which is why I say most of us in the UK at the moment can probably ignore it. But let's just pretend that your magnetic variation is actually 20 degrees to the west, so it's all the way over there. What do we do to compensate for that? And it's um, quite straightforward. So if your magnetic variation is to the west, as is shown on this diagrammatic here, you simply add the magnetic variation onto your compass bearing in order to correct for that variation. If this magnetic arrow is to the east, then you subtract the magnetic variation from the compass bearing. So the value of uh, magnetic variation where you are can either be calculated like I've just shown you, or else you can go on the internet and it will tell you what the current value is. But let's just pretend that we've discovered that our magnetic variation is actually 20 degrees west. Um, we've taken our map bearing of 100 degrees so what we need to do is to add 20 degrees onto that map bearing to accommodate for the variation. So we've now not following a 100 degree bearing, we're following 120 degrees. If you found out that your variation was 20 degrees to the east, you would subtract that bearing so you'd be running on a 80 degree bearing not a 100 degree bearing. So that's how you um, account for magnetic variation. As I say in the UK at the moment in um, normal kind of civilian circumstances like non-military uh, I think largely it can be ignored. Um, there's a couple of instances where maybe you might try and account for it that will come up in part two of um, this video series. But uh, like I say, I'm just gonna go back to the bearing that I took off the map 
that I know is going to be within about half a degree accurate of 100 degrees. So um, now we've got our bearing, what do we actually do with it? Having got your bearing, it's useful to know the distance that you need to travel on that bearing to get to your target. And this is where these scales here come in handy. On my compass here, there's several scales depending on the, the scale of the map. This is a 1 to 25,000 map. And basically, one grid square equates to a marking of 10 on the scale. So that 10 is 1,000 metres, 8 is 800 metres, 6 is 600 metres, and so on. So now what we want to do is to see what the distance is between the two points that we're going to travel between. So the target is in the right corner there at naught and the summit of Gale Barrow is about 650 odd metres. So we know we've got to travel around 650 metres in order to get to where we want to be and we'll see what we're going to use that information for in part two of this video but for now we just need to figure out because it's all misty uh, we need to work out what direction are we actually going to travel in in order to hit our destination okay we can put our um, map in our pocket now for a little bit um, we've got our bearing shown on the compass of 100 degrees and we've got our direction of travel arrow and what we need to do now is make sure we're pointing in the right direction and the way we do that is by turning our entire body around until we have the red north needle from the compass in the red arrow on the compass housing and I'll just take it away and put it back in again. I know I think the scouts and um, people in America they call the red arrow the shed and obviously the magnetic needles red also and they use the term to put the red in the shed as we've done there. And now what we want to do is to look to see what direction we want to go in. And that's done with our direction of travel arrow there. And we can see that's the direction that we've got to, to walk in. Now to follow this bearing for 650 metres is... Um, quite an undertaking so what you actually do is you break it down into a series of legs and what we want to do is you hold the compass roughly at chest height and you look at the direction of travel arrow and look to see if there's some point about 100 meters away that the direction of travel arrow is pointing to and you can see there's a little footpath running along the top left of the screen and there's a kink in that footpath about halfway along that's about 100 meters away and our compass is pointing straight to that so that's what you walk to first so you can now put your compass away for a little while making sure you don't adjust the dial so here we are I've now got to the kink in the footpath so now this is where you stop and you get your compass out and you look to see where you're supposed to be traveling next. So we take the compass out of the pocket, put the compass needle in the red arrow, put the red in the shed if you like, and look to see where your next 
little stepping stone is going to be and looks like it's going to be the left hand edge of that green bank just by the side of the trees that you can see there again that's probably another 100 meters away so i've got to that bank repeating again i can see quite a prominent tree probably 150 meters away so that's where i'm going to head now so what we're actually doing is um following this bearing by leapfrogging our way across a number of stepping stones around 100 or 150 meters apart until we hit the target that we're after and that's what i'm going to keep doing now until i come across the um footpath and little shooting lodge that is shown on the map um, of course you're imagining that i'm actually surrounded by mist and not it being a lovely sunny day and the sort of stepping stones that i'd be using if i was really on the edge of galbarrow fell would be um, hummocks of grass or bits of rock or anything that just sort of sticks out that you can aim at basically um, here it's trees usually but um, you wouldn't get that say up on the side of a mountain so here we are we've hit a footpath so what we've done then is traveled from the top of gal barrow there followed a bearing to intersect this footpath here and you can see there's a very small structure there it's marked as a shooting lodge um, in actual fact it's uh, just a crumbling few walls and if you use your imagination you can see it just there coming out the mist on Galbarrow Fell. And what we've got to do now is turn right to contour gradually downhill towards the shores of Oldswater. In theory, you could take a bearing to make sure you were going in the right direction and not accidentally heading that way, um, but it's, it's obvious in this case. So there we are, that's how to take a bearing. Um, the only complicated bit is really the magnetic variation side of it um, and even that's not that complicated and thankfully as I say in the UK you can ignore that um, but the really great thing is is uh, I'm here in Sussex and I've been able to show you how to do this using a real life scenario but actually using a location and a scenario that's based on a mountainside in the Lake District so what this means is you can trot off to your local park and practice all this sort of thing in um, complete safety uh, until you get uh, confident with it. So in this video then we've covered um, the sort of situations where you really might want to take a bearing, um, looked at the basics of a compass, looked at how to use it in conjunction with your map to take a bearing, and how to account for magnetic variation if you need to and how to actually follow that bearing by using a series of stepping stones in the next video we'll look at some additional techniques so that whilst you're traveling on your bearing you can get a feeling for where you actually are um, so we're going to cover things like pacing and naismith's rule so uh, yeah, I'll um, probably put that one up in a couple of weeks time, but I hope you found this one useful and in the meantime, cheerio.